Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It's a good time to start a workshop. Welcome to the Oak Harbor City Council workshop meeting. Uh, Mayor Bob Severance cannot be with us on this workshop. So let's go ahead, uh, start with introducing ourselves around the table. I'll go ahead and start and go to my left. I'm Danny Pagao, Mayor of Potem. Tara Heisen, City Council. Joel Cervantes, City Council. Jim Campbell, City Council. Rick Oliver, City Council. Beth Mann, City Council. Doug Merriman, City Administrator. Steve Powers, Director of Development Services. Kat Kamak, Senior Planner. Erica Wassinger, City Council. And we also have city staff outside the table. If you please introduce yourself and start. Ray Lindenberg, Associate Planner. Emma House, HR Director. Ryan Lee, Building Official. Ray Merrill, Fire Chief. Kevin Rushford, Police Chief. Al Levy, Planning Commission. <laughs> Dennis LaFever, Senior Planner. Patricia Sol, Finance Director, Kevin Rosenberg, Works Director, Nikki Esparza, City Attorney, Nicole Tash, uh, Executive Assistant, City Administrator. Okay, thank you everyone. Now we'll start with our number one departmental briefings. This is the Arts Commission update uh, from the Development Services will be presented by Mr. Jack Yes, yeah. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to give the City Council uh, a couple of items that um, are kind of um, uh, precipitating at the Arts Commission level and an agenda item that's coming forward uh, to you at the next meeting. So first I'll touch on the agenda item that's coming to you at the next meeting. I have copies of the agenda bill uh, here and uh, an exhibit, maybe you can go this way. So um, as the agenda bill is coming around, I'll just kind of give a brief intro. Uh, this agenda bill is related to the, arts piece, to the art piece that's proposed on the corner of Highway 20 and Northeast 4th. This is the one by the Farmer's Market. This is the one that's called Autumn Leaves, and uh, the exhibit is coming around from the other side. Um, it's on the southeast corner, uh, right by the fields, by the middle school. Uh, this piece is about 15 to 20 feet tall and 45 feet uh, wide. And so it's a fairly big structure. And um, we awarded the contract to make this piece to architectural element from Bellingham. They do a lot of metal work and they do a lot of um, uh, art, art related projects. So at the end of last year, uh, we, uh, the city council actually had, uh, approved an amendment to their contract. Uh, they had one year to complete the project. Uh, we had some difficulty in how the pipes were being able to bend. Uh, it took some time to find the right place to do it. Eventually we've got that done and now we're working on some of the leaves and kind of what metal and how to make them light and, and so on. So there's some work that's being continuing uh, to be done on this project, so we wanted an extension of the time, and so in December we came to City Council, and the Council approved an amendment to extend the time for another year so that we can continue to work on it. Um, as we were continuing to get into the installation phase, we uh, were informed that this particular art piece needs a building permit, just because of its size and the foundation um, that needs to be reviewed for safety. So this was not anticipated when the project first started to get a building permit. In order to get a building permit for this, we do need an engineer to do some wind analysis to it. So for example, you know, one of the leaves that's here, the topmost leaf over here, if you see the pipe that it's connected to, it's connected at least 20 to 25 feet away to the foundation. That's a, that's a structural analysis that needs to be done in order to determine you know, whether the foundation is going to be strong enough to do it. So the building permit requires an engineer, professional engineer, to do it. So I need, there's two ways we could do it. The city can go out and hire an engineer to do this analysis because it is a project that we commissioned as a city. Uh, or we can ask the artist to hire an engineer and include that service into their, into their contract. We think it's time saving and resource saving to ask the artist to hire an engineer to perform the analysis for the building permit. So we want to amend the contract and include a cost for the engineering services for this project. So we're bringing forth an amendment to you at the next meeting. The cost of engineering services is about $3,200. 
So this would be in addition to uh, the cost of the project. So this is something uh, that uh, we've learned recently in the last two, three weeks. And so we'll bring that forward so we can do all that analysis and then get it permitted in order for construction. So this is just to, to introduce this item. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a big piece. Um, I'm excited for it. Two questions. Is the tubing, you said it's sw switched around as opposed to square. What is the actual, it says steel, but is it stainless or how do we protect it's, that from the elements? Um, it's, uh, now, it's not a square, it's a circular tubing. Right. And it's steel. Yeah. It's spray painted and we hope that that withstands the elements or? Um, we, that decision has not been made yet, and we're having a subcommittee look at it to see if we want to leave it in its natural state or do we want to paint it. They're looking at the leaves right now, and they're looking at a couple of textures on the leaves, and they want to be able to match it up with that, so that decision is still pending. Okay. I'd just be curious to you know, want to make it as uh, maintenance-free as possible. And yes. Another question, you talked about engineering, and that big, long 20-foot span, is it so inflexible that they couldn't connect that reverse S right below it and touch some of those pieces together? There, there could be, um, yes, and all of those needs to be engineered. We don't know how each of these tubes will connect to each other. We also want to look for safety, where we're cinching points. Mm -hmm. So there's more work to be done in, in the design of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, we're working on all of that. Thank you. Mrs. Oh, thank you. Do you have any doubts or reservation about the artist picking an engineer? I'm just... No, they're, um, they're, they're a good firm from okay. Bellingham. They're a big, one of the bigger firms. They've done several projects in Bellingham, scale, large scale projects. Um, and they may have, um, they, they have an engineering background as a, as a, as a company. It's not a single artist. It's a, oh, okay. it's, it's a, it's a company and there are they're metal fabricators, and they do a lot of metal work. So I have no doubt. So you, okay. Yes. I just, I just thought an artist yeah. going through picking out an engineer. And <laughs> yes. Wasn't so sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So, Mr. Mac, uh, you said that the the architect, engineer, and the fabricator are, are all in one house. They have an engineering background in the sense they've done engineering projects, but I don't know if they have an engineering staff. Are they going, so you don't know if it's going to be in-house engineer? They are hiring somebody outside. They've already contacted me, and they've contacted an external engineer and got the estimate, and that's how I know it's $3,200. Okay, $3, what is the estimate? $3,200. $3,200. And what is the original cost? Uh, 45 for, have it here on the agenda bill. 42,563. It's on the stage. Okay, I just haven't gotten back to yeah. that part yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, refresh my memory on what is the First Amendment? This is the Second Amendment. The First Amendment was to extend the time. So, the First Amendment was uh, to, uh, the original contract had installation date before December 31st, 2016. We added one year to the contract, and that was the First Amendment. And do you think it's necessary to add one year, an additional one year? Why don't we get this wrapped up in six months? All right, plan is to get it wrapped up in four or five. We added one year just to give okay. us enough cushion. Okay, on the second page, you have items that answer the rest of my questions. So I'll let it go with that. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I have uh, another idea that is uh, coming up through the Arts Commission as well. This is an idea actually Council Member Heisen floated with the uh, Arts Commission. They have taken a look at it and they like the idea. Um, we're, they're continuing to work on it, but I wanted to run this by City Council so that you guys have an idea of what they're working on, number one, and two, if you have any thoughts on it, uh, this would be a great time to provide some feedback. So while that's coming along, I'll give you a little brief overview on this. And of course, uh, Council Member Heisen can always uh, uh, supplement this information. So this was an idea that's brought up um, to basically generate um, and create interest with local art. 
there's a lot of interest in trying to uh, do things locally, to generate things locally. And so this was an idea that came uh, with that in mind, and it involves painting uh, fire hydrants, like adopt a fire hydrant. And the, uh, the idea here is that it would be, let's say, along Pioneer Way and Highway 20, the two most prominent visited uh, areas in town uh, for visitors. And so the program would be to, uh, you know, have these fire hydrants available for a group or a group of citizens or a family or some person in the community to adopt it and then to create some art on it. And um, there are some programs around the, uh, uh, the country that have done this, so this is not something that's new. And that's the example that um, um, I passed around, the uh, city of Greenville, I think it's North Carolina, where they have a template. Um, they open it out for the community to, um, to generate ideas. It'll go through a review process and then eventually they'll get to paint the fire hydrant uh, based on the approved uh, design. Of course, this is a program. We'll have to come up with criteria that's suitable uh, for painting fire hydrants. We have to determine uh, you know, what kind of paint, uh, who supplies the paint. Uh, there's still some questions on how to actually get this program going, but nevertheless, it's a, it, it's a good idea to explore and the Arts Commission uh, is behind it. So I wanted to introduce this idea to City Council and generate some discussion on it. And if you have any thoughts, if this is something that um, we think is not a good idea, this would be the time for me to know before we invest mm -hmm. a lot of time in it. So I wanted to bring this up as early as possible so that you have uh, an, a view on it and can provide some input on it. Questions? Okay. Any comment? Raise this one. So I'm guessing the fire department is just now hearing about this? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> before, before even I could take it to Arts Commission and, and allow the, them to weigh in, I wanted to make sure that the fire department is, is involved and, and they're okay with it. So I am coordinating with them. There's more work that I have to do with them. There are some requirements. Every fire hydrant has a number. Those numbers have to be visible. So there are things that we have to design to make sure that there are duties are not compromised and these fire hydrants don't become camouflaged and they can't mm -hmm. find them. Uh, so we'll have some criteria for that, but I think they're okay with that. Uh, we'll choose the appropriate type of paint uh, that'll work for their purposes as well. So uh, yeah, they're okay with that. I think it's a great idea, um, especially if we dictate what type of paint, the criteria for it to last, but there's a point where it will fade. So do we have a backup program when it gets chipped, dinged, or uh, faded? So uh, we'll have to develop that. So the initial idea and thoughts are that um, if somebody adopts it and the paint is, let's say, good for two to three years probably, uh, depending on the quality of the paint, if that group uh, wants to continue to adopt it, they can continue to repaint it. If that group has disappeared, moved away, and there's nobody there, now I know the fire department has a cycle where they hire volunteers to go paint this, so that will go back to whatever the original paint was, and if somebody else comes forward to adopt it, they can. So hopefully we won't end up with faded art in the process. So it will be a, like a revolving art. If there's somebody to take care of it, they can take care of it till, till the time they can. If they can't, then it will go back to being a regular fire height. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, I think it's a great idea. I think maybe it was a year ago we were at an AWC conference and one of the classes was all about parks and art and ways that local artists and community members were able to participate um, in art in public spaces and how sort of powerful that was for the community. So I, I think it's a great idea. I think too, I don't know where we have, all we have fire hydrants, but you know, along Bayshore too is heavily foot trafficked and the parks and anywhere close that I think people are outside and able to see it and um, you know, something neat that may draw people outside. Absolutely. Uh, walking on our streets and in our parks, I, I think it's a great idea as long as it's safe and follows all of the rules and isn't gonna, gonna hurt anything. 
I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think we can start off with the downtown and Highway 20, see mm -hmm. how the program goes. There's enough interest to, you know, if all the fire hydrants are taken and, and there's more interest to expand it, we'll definitely come back here and see what areas mm -hmm. we can expand into. We definitely don't want to just ran at the very offset, open it out to any fire, mm -hmm. fire hydrant in the city because they'll be spaced out and there are issues with that. So we can start with specific areas and if there's interest, we can expand the program. Okay. Mr. Alfred, go ahead. Yes. Um, you know, if some of my cougar friends <laughs> decided to paint one that's a, with a cougar on it, and I brought my husky dog by. <laughs> Would that be considered a misdemeanor? <laughs> I'll let the police or the fire. <laughs> Bringing this up, uh, I think I've seen a couple of cities with also arts and fire hydrants. One was uh, the city outside Orlando in Florida, and I forgot the other one, but it's pretty, pretty good. Mm -hmm. you know, it looks nice. All right. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. The next one, the second one, is uh, pending agenda items. This is uh, requesting revision to the concomitant agreement to the Kmart Shopping Center from admin. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council. Um, what we have is a request to amend a, a uh, concomitant zoning agree agreement that was originally signed in 1987 for the what is commonly known as the Kmart Shopping Center. Um, that agreement included a couple of things in there that become, have become problematic since then. Um, number one, there was a reference to a prohibition to certain types of uses, adult uses. Um, adult uh, theater and bookstores were not permitted. That is a constitutional thing. It's also covered by our zoning ordinance. Wouldn't be allowed there anyway, so that's one of the things we want to remove out of the concomitant agreement. And then also um, to remove a prohibition on secondhand retail stores. Um, the, uh, the owners of that parcel have found a potential user that wants to do a secondhand store. And so they want to have that removed to allow that user to, to enter into that uh, shopping center and, and open a retail store there. So those are the two things that we were looking at uh, changing on the concomitant agreement. Um, we just wanted to bring that to you here today so we have a chance to kind of discuss it a little bit if you have any questions or anything about it um, and then bring it back to actually have it uh, fully realized and signed and everything. So um, the owners, the multiple owners of that shopping center are all uh, in agreement on that and that's something they want to move forward with. Seeing that. Thanks, Ray. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Going to the third item. This is the emerging issues. First one is discussion on lodging tax reserves. Also from admin, Dr. Merrill. Okay. Uh, this was a good candidate for emerging issues because we don't have something for today. But what we'd like to do is have this to come forward again next month. And the topic that we're interested in and in learning about and getting your input on is what level of reserves do we want to retain in our lodging tax fund? And this has come up a few different times. Um, primarily, we've heard it the last couple of years when our LTAC has met, and when they're trying to decide how much money are we gonna have in the grant program that, that year. Um, we used to run anywhere from 15 to 20,000 a year. Lately, you've seen we've done a lot more than that. Um, but the, the question is, how much money do we retain in there if we were to get a project or a capital acquisition or something we wanna do at some point where lodging tax would make sense as a means to bring people to Oak Harbor. So not only have had that in the LTAC, council has dealt with this in the past as well. Uh, historically, we had two large projects that used or were slated to use 2% money. Uh, one we used to call the clock tower, or it was the downtown plaza that had a clock tower on it. Uh, that has since come off the books. We took an action a couple of years ago to remove that one. 
However, we still have an adopted plan still outstanding that used a significant amount of 2%, and that was the Roger Brooks plan. So even though there's probably some items in that plan we may not do in the future just because the environment has changed, we still have a commitment somewhat to keep that funding in place should we decide to do those things. So there's some discussion we need to have as far as what commitments do we have in the past are they still valid today? And then as we're looking forward into the future, what things do we want to think about where lodging tax might help us achieve those things if there's a tourism element to those items? So that's a, a discussion that we need to have. Uh, so what I wanted to do is at least bring that up and start that, that conversation so that perhaps next month we'll bring that forward again. And if you all could be thinking about these are some thoughts I've had, something I would like to do, something that we could probably use some of that 2% for. Um, so we can have a discussion that better defines how much we're keeping in reserves. Uh, we'd like to be able to provide that answer to the community when they're wondering, why don't you put the whole 600,000 you have in the fund into grants this year? Um, well, we have to remember that the state, their design for the lodging tax program is you want it to be sustainable. It's not spend it all this year and then we're back to $15,000 again. So we want to have some good discussion as far as what we think our policy would be, um, how we want to divide that up, what do we want to keep in reserves versus spend. I think it would be helpful to the LTAC as well. I think when Mr. Campbell was on the LTAC a couple of years ago, the LTAC themselves went through an exercise to try to make that decision and they were able to do it for that year, but then as the next year comes and there's new members and a new environment, um, some of those previous decisions kind of faded away. So I think uh, this would be a good discussion to have and it would be helpful to a lot of different people on that. So if you can put on your creative hats and be thinking about that, I'll probably be given a couple phone calls uh, as we do our regular calls and just seeing what things we're thinking about, we can bring that forward. And that's really what I have for that today. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions now? Uh, just, a just a general question. What um, what are the the laws? I'm pretty familiar with the annual, the LTAC committee, um, just the exercise we just went, went through this year. But as far as the reserves, what, what is the, the process with the LTAC committee? Do they have any? I mean, is that something that they have to approve if we come up with a plan or... Or is that something that we can just adopt as a city council and, and say this is what it is and continue to say, okay, you have this chunk for your um, grant, you know, approvals. Is that sort of how it works? Or? Yeah, and I'd have to do a little bit of research because if council adopted a policy mm -hmm. that said we would like to structure it this way, mm -hmm. under the new rules that were passed, mm -hmm. well, 2013, mm -hmm. um, is that a change in use? Does it fit that clause? And under the statute, then a, a change in use has to go to the LTAC mm -hmm. for a recommendation. Mm -hmm. So it would probably be safe that if we had a proposed policy to run it through the LTAC and get their, their way in on that as well. Mr. Thank you. Do we have a plan that you would like council to discuss this so that the LTAC can start meeting earlier than October, like maybe August even? and they have a few months to go through and digest things instead of like wham bam and that's it and everyone seems to kind of be upset so yeah. could we move it earlier and then this decision we can sort of coordinate it between the timing between the two you bet and we noticed that this year where we used to have maybe five or six applicants this year I believe we had 14 uh, so just even logistically trying to process all that and getting enough time to get good input and conversation, we need to start earlier. And that's the goal for this year is to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Merriman, can we use those funds also for city project, uh, for example, improvements in Windjammer Park? Yes, you can. The, do keep in mind though that even if the city wants to use those funds under state law, we're considered an applicant for those So we still have to apply for it? We still have to apply and send that through the LTAC uh, to get their input on that. Okay. But, but you can use those. Thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Merriman, 
we are planning to have a special workshop for the council for this uh, subject or uh, you talk about the retreat for the council, can we incorporate that in that manner session? Sure. Um, the retreat that we're potentially looking at, you'll be getting more information on this, will probably be in April. So probably what I would suggest doing is why don't we bring this back in February at this workshop and have those discussions. Um, April might be waiting a little too long, but uh, depending on what comes out of those discussions in February, you know, we can bring those up or see where that leads and maybe that would be one of the topics on our retreat agenda that we talk about. Thank you. Sure. Any further questions, comments? If not, thank you. The next one on item 3B is discussion regarding security cameras in downtown Oak Harbor. Again, we'll make mm -hmm. presentation, Dr. Merriman. But this was an opportunity that came up at one of our previous council meetings. Council Member Heisen had brought up uh, the question of could we have a time to talk about cameras in the downtown? Uh, so what we wanted to do, at least have an open discussion on it because we don't have a staff you know, recommendation or anything on that yet, but we're interested in knowing what other council members feel. I've talked to Mayor Severns on the subject. He has some different thoughts on cameras and those things. Uh, we've also run it through staff. Nikki Esparza uh, has given it some legal considerations as well as uh, Chief Dresker has some thoughts on and experiences as well. So really today there's not a suggestion or a recommendation from staff. We want to open up the discussion and uh, give Councilmember Heisen an opportunity to expound a little bit on what she would like to do, if you would like to do that. Uh, otherwise, it's just an open time to, to address the topic. Thank you. So who would like to start? Anyone? Any comments, questions? Go ahead, <laughs> let's start. Um, I suggested this after seeing uh, a couple of different demonstrations of security cameras at a number of conferences, and I was extremely impressed at some of the devices that they have out there and how flexible they are and how high quality and how inexpensive they are. And so, you know, pair that with all of the vandalism and stuff that's happening downtown that everybody's complaining about and we need to hire more police, which costs a fortune. Um, versus put up a seven or eight thousand dollar camera that can see 24 hours a day in 360 degrees. So, um, you know, no human can do that. So I thought that was a possible um, solution, deterrent, I'm, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, lots and lots of other cities have done this. I've talked to people in those cities. Um, they've had nothing but good experiences with it. And um, it's hard to quantify whether or not it, it prevents things, but it certainly helps uh, figure things out after the fact. So um, I think the, the brand that I forwarded you, um, they can be moved around, they're not um, fixed, so if there's a specific event, we can move them. Um, so I thought maybe it'd be cool to start out with one or two and see, and, and ICOM can tap into them and see exactly what's happening in real time if there's a camera near a call. Um, so. I just thought it was worthy of discussion. Thank you. Mr. Chapatis. Thank you. I'll be curious to hear what Mrs. Spars or Chief Dresker has to say, but I would very much support it. Anytime we can use technology to increase efficiencies, uh, and, unless it's just astronomically unaffordable, I don't know why we wouldn't do that. So I'd be curious to hear any research and or experience you've had, Chief, as far as it being a productive or effective, whether it's for prevention or size and said model and what happened after the fact. So <laughs> So um, I, I guess there's two things that I would be concerned with. First of all would be um, implementing a policy before we went ahead and, and installed the cameras. And um, I think that would involve some public participation and really hearing what um, the citizens are comfortable with. Um, my main concern is actually one that would hit the Public Records Act. So these cameras, they are going to generate public records. There's a 30-day retention requirement on all of the footage that, um, that we would generate. And um, of course, 
those the footage is subject to the Public Records Act. And so that would increase staff time significantly because somebody would have to be um, monitoring the public records requests that were coming in and going through the footage, seeing if there's anything that needs to be exempted or redacted. And frankly, we don't actually have the technology to exempt or redact footage at this point. Um, so it would create certainly additional workload for the staff um, from a public records perspective. And, and that is something to be cognizant of when we're thinking about implementing a program like this. So, yeah, so from, from my perspective, you know, obviously anything that we can get that'll either deter or help us, deter crime or help us uh, catch somebody who does a, uh, partake in criminal activity uh, can be a good thing. Uh, the complications with the cameras, and, and there's, I guess, a couple ways you could look at it, is one, do you put permanent cameras up in different locations, or do you put one that's up that's a mobile platform? So both are po possible. Um, and so you, have, you look at that, and so if, to be a deterrent, uh, people know it's there and know that they may get captured on, on film. Uh, we've seen from some of the rioting that's occurred around the country, a lot of times people will uh, conceal themselves when they in, have the intent to commit a crime but it still can help you with clothing and stuff like that. Uh, so there's good, there's good parts to it, um, having that available. Some of the issues are if, if when cameras are ever used, you have to make sure that they're used in a forensic capacity because there's no way you can have somebody sitting there 24 seven watching a camera. And if people have that expectation, um, it can create issues and liabilities. And so forensically, you can go back and look at things that have occurred and then hopefully it'll act as a deterrent. The cost benefit is, is, is one thing that has to be looked at. You know, is the activity enough to warrant whatever the infrastructure is going to take and the staffing is going to take to maintain that, uh, clean it, upkeep it, uh, improve it, you know, whatever the, the case is, and then the public records request. That's in Washington State the big thing right now because of the public records. Somebody can request that information, and you've seen stuff put out on YouTube once in a while that they get from these public records requests. So those are concerns too. Um, you know, we as police often will go to businesses and say, hey, do you have camera footage of this area because we had a crime? And we get our stuff from private businesses uh, by that and it helps us quite a bit. And those, uh, that type of stuff is not uh, subject to public records requests. Uh, the businesses have their personal rights to those and then they maintain those and it can cover an area and we can go to them and say, hey, we had something happen, can, do you have potential video? And, we, and we've often, in my career, have often gotten useful stuff from that. And that can also act as a deterrent. So, you know, there's a real cost-benefit analysis. Having video is, is always a good thing if you can get it. It's just whether, um, how, you, how you implement that. Yes, we have one of those businesses, <laughs> personally, that uses cameras. Um, and the type of cameras, just, I know this is a real personal business thing, but um, they are real easy to search, ours are real easy to search for, for a certain time or a certain transaction. You know, it's, it's very high tech, um, the system that we have. But what I have noticed in, in our business with our cameras, and I guess this is a question, is that even if someone is caught on camera do, doing something illegal or what we perceive to be, be Ill, illegal activity that we would call you guys, um, we've had experiences where you'll come in and even based on the footage that you see, you still can't make an arrest because it just wasn't enough. It happens often, you know, something was there that legally you can't even do anything um, to help. I mean, you can question, but um, so I, I know it's, it, it's a, what you're saying is, is, is the benefit, is the cost of it worth, you know, worth, worth putting it in and worth doing it. Um, but I will say too that, um, Again, in my experience, especially at Volunteer Park, which is right by the, the skate park, um, my husband and I volunteer in that park uh, in this all spring, halfway through the summer, and then all fall. And, and it's a problem. It's a problem with graffiti. It's a problem with people breaking into the buildings that are there in our park, um, the, the um, dugouts and the score booths and our equipment sheds. It happens on a weekly basis it seemed like that something we would have to call and make a report and we started doing that weekly just to have the the public record of, of us saying that there's a problem so i would to weigh that would would a camera out there help 
with that, help deter that, that my husband and I are putting in our time to clean it up every before I get there 15 minutes before every practice to clean up beer bottles, liquor bottles, cigarette butts, trash, used condoms. I mean, you name it, we've cleaned it up out there numerous times. Um, so I, I can see both ways, but it's, I think, a real toss-up of, of weighing the, um, the benefits versus the cost of, of the system, but I think it's worthy of a discussion. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Do we really have a problem downtown? I think this was directed to the downtown area initially. Do we really have a problem down there that cameras would be a deterrent I probably mad it probably is determined by who you talk to and the perspective <laughs> um, I, I know the downtown association um, you know wants to have a clean environment wants to have a, an environment free of, of any problems just like anybody else does and uh, we so I, I think it's a matter of perspective you know we had the recent thefts that occurred down there from the holiday decorations I know that that uh, was something that was disturbing to the downtown environment as for most of us uh, there's other nuisance type of things too. I know somebody talked about cigarette butts being thrown down there, uh, which is you know so it could be littering. So there's there's a, a variety. Are we responding like some of the problems that I've heard that have been in the past? No, we're not at the levels that you know we're decreased in that capacity. You know some of that too as far as deterrent. Um, some people will be aware and conscious of it. Some people don't think. If you have somebody who's uh, maybe under the influence of something, they're not going to really think about a camera, whether they're doing a crime. But again, a camera could help us try to determine who that person was. So there's not a negative to that aspect of it. It's just a matter of uh, a decision to be made as to whether or not that infrastructure and the costs is such to, um, and will it take care of that problem? It won't, it won't deter everybody. It'll deter some, but then, uh, it may help with some other, some other uh, solving some things too. So then a question for the city attorney. If the downtown association, without involving public funds, decided to put in their own camera system, are they subject to the um, public records request? No, they are not. That may be- They're not an agency under um, the public records act. Yeah that may be a solution for targeting specific areas by the downtown association of riches um, maybe trying to reduce the crime and vandalism in that area and those those systems and i have one private one erica has a private one and really they are not that expensive they truly aren't on an individual basis and um and then you have to wonder who's going to monitor the thing. Um, I can go back and pull up records online, but that's the only private ones. So it might be better that this is a situation that is resolved privately rather than through a public structure. Thank you. Um, to comment on Mr. Allenberg's point, my concern with the downtown association owning the cameras is that they would be the only ones with access to the footage. It wouldn't run through ICOM, it wouldn't be accessible by the PD, it wouldn't be accessible by the fire department, etc., um, which is part of the benefit, in my view. So just throwing that out there. And uh, we currently have cameras here at City Hall at the treatment plant construction site. There's one in front of ICOM. Is there one at the police station? Oh, we have internal just for internal for, yeah. okay do we have we gotten public records requests for footage of any of our existing cameras not that i'm aware of <clears throat> thank you mr Rubatius. so it does bring up an interesting point um, um, joe's over there somewhere do we have are we recording you say it's an internal camera i've seen them there when you go in the front lobby of the police department is that not recording the hard drive is it just replaying on or maybe you don't want to say <laughs> <laughs> to my knowledge it's just a visual thing for our it's uh, for our uh, jailers who are watching the inmates and stuff okay so you know the thought i have i'd still like to research this issue some more is you may have an area that says this area under video surveillance 
you know, we could have two cameras mounted there and maybe those cameras record only during certain hours. We know in prime time, probably, uh, time frames are, so maybe they only record certain, during those certain times, or maybe they're not recording in the public or a ne'er-do-well wouldn't necessarily know that. I don't know if that would be a deterrent. It would be an interesting uh, social experiment, possibly, but in businesses, you'll see cameras all the time, and the question is, you know, are any large commercial store, there's a million what seem to be cameras in there, the question is, are those cameras? So, uh, once again, I, I'm still interested in seeing how it's worked possibly for other cities, if it made sense financially, if they saw in certain areas any kind of a, a deterrent with graffiti or people hanging out in the parks that should be there in the evening. So, I don't know how we go about obtaining any hard evidence on that, but I think it's worth looking into. Thank you, Mr. Sobeyes. Any further comment, question? If not, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sparsa. We'll proceed to 3C, and this is the adoption of FEMA 2015 flood insurance rate maps, or cover municipal code update chapter 17.02 from Development Services. Brian Lee, building official, will handle nice that. Nice to be you. Yes. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council. Um, similar to the process that we go through on a triennial basis with the building codes, we periodically have updates to our FEMA uh, flood insurance rate maps. Uh, these are not on a regu regularly scheduled basis. They come out as FEMA has new information that's available for adoption. Um, in 2015, FEMA uh, prepared some new studies for the Oak Harbor and Island County area. And so as a result, uh, they have adjusted some of the boundary lines of some of our flood zones. They have also increased the intensity of some of our flood zones as well. Uh, primarily, these considerations are due to uh, scientific studies that they do with both um, climatic change and then our local effects that, that happen here in the Puget Sound. Uh, what we'd like to bring forth to you at, at a uh, upcoming council meeting would be uh, adoption of the new maps. There are five maps that cover the city of uh, Oak Harbor. What you're seeing here is uh, just one of those maps, uh, panel 120. Again, we have five different panels that we use. Uh, and these are the proposed changes that, that we're looking at as far as uh, flood areas. And so, again, as I mentioned, some of the changes would be uh, expansion of the boundaries and then increase in intensities or elevations, if you will, as to what expected uh, flood areas may involve. So this is the overall uh, Oak Harbor Bay Area. And uh, zooming in on that, with our with our new um, uh, maps, you can see that. Uh, it's just got a pointer on it. Steve, does. that button. Oh, whoop, that nope. was the off That's button. That's not the one. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's the one up here that okay. has the light. Imagine if you will. Yeah, <laughs> as you can see. Yeah, this one up here. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, as you'll see up in this area, right in here, we have an expansion. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. These council members were oh, looking at this okay. screen. And, and then yeah. I'll yeah, yeah. point sorry. out over here. We, we've got expanded areas. As you can see, this is uh, Pioneer Boulevard. Uh, we now have areas that uh, have expanded beyond Pioneer Boulevard. Um, we're also expanding east, if you will, on some of these ends. And we're also establishing 
very specific flood elevation zones. Um, whoops. There you go. Flood elevation zones, as you can see, elevation 13, 14. Uh, we get actually up to as high as uh, a velocity elevation of 20 uh, along the um, uh, oh, did I turn it off again? I think so. Okay, I'm there sorry. Ah, uh, there it goes. Um, so, okay, as as we get down into these southern areas uh, of, of the town, um, so we we've got a significant change within those those areas. Uh, again, just for comparison with our existing maps that were adopted back in 2007. Again, you can see here's Pioneer Boulevard. There's no, um, no blue area, if you will, um, north of, of uh, Pioneer uh, Boulevard and the Pioneer Way. And you can also see that the areas along Bayshore, uh, goodness, along Bayshore uh, that have also now been in, included into these, to these zones. Um, also the uh, area down here, portion of which is uh, city uh, controlled properties and, and uh, friend properties um, are, are also now included in these areas. Um, again, this is an informational, we're bringing this forward to you as a piece of information that it's going to be coming up at uh, a near hearing. And we will also eventually as part of this be working on the critical areas uh, plan and providing updates that would reflect these particular changes um, that are necessary to remain as a partner in the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, that concludes my presentation, unless you have any questions. Thank you. Um, with the expansion of this, will the city notify uh, property owners that weren't necessarily in a certain flood area that this could be a difference in their insurance policy or something? I mean, most people, you don't even think about this till it floods, and then you find it, oh, well, back in so-and-so, the city you know, adopted the new legislation or the rules or whatever you want to call it. But I would think that the city, I don't know, through the water bills or something, it would be nice to inform people in certain areas that you might want to check or you can come in and look at a map or, I mean, what this is not something you normally do until you want to. And most people wouldn't think about it. And then all of a sudden they're caught in a predicament because they haven't planned on it. So uh, Brian tells me that FEMA will let folks know, but I, we could also, if the council directed, um, we could just pull the property owner information and, and send a specific letter to them. Uh, we did talk about this uh, quite some time ago, uh, and so we were hopeful that in part our past conversations about this have helped those people understand. Um, but we can do a direct mailing. It wouldn't be that hard. I would. Yeah really like to see that because that's the only way you're good neighbors and if we want everyone to feel like part of the community and we're backing them then we, we should help make sure certain information gets out if it's not a whole lot of money i can't see why we wouldn't do it i think it's pretty straightforward we're still the majority property owner within right. the area right uh, but you know and i think just guessing off the top of my head the the new private property that's coming into the area uh, those are by our standards fairly large parcels anyway so you know we're not going to have dozens upon dozens of, of new owners per se will probably be a, a fairly short list right yeah um does this make any difference with the wastewater treatment plant that we're already pretty close to finishing on what this was all taken this was all taken into account okay i thought it yeah. was i just would like to have that clarified thank you thank you Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, 
since you already answered the question about the wastewater treatment plant, I'm curious what is the date of the previous mapping and the and the date of the revised mapping? What is the sure. timeline? Yes, uh, the, the date of the prior maps was uh, February 2nd, 2007. And the effective date of these revised maps is March 7th, 2017. And how we, how, how that March 7th, 2017 date is established is the Department of Ecology for the state of Washington uh, goes through and does a formal adoption. And within six months, the city's then required to uh, update its maps and its ordinance to remain as a participant in the National uh, Floodplain Insurance Program. Uh, if we haven't adopted by March 7th, then, uh, then uh, our ordinance becomes uh, null and void, if you will. So we have to adopt this in order to protect it our ability, the community's ability to have flood insurance yes. in that area. Okay. So in that 10 year period, what, what really changed? Was it the methodology or did something happen in plant or turf that caused us to change? <clears throat> yes. Uh, the um, Department of Ecology and FEMA had uh, gone out and prepared some very specific studies. Uh, their uh, recorded uh, elevation uh, changes that they've gone out and surveyed. Uh, they prepare what is called uh, a flood insurance study and in that flood insurance study where they've taken their documentation they call those transects and in those transects those reflect the very specific criteria as to what they learned from their studies. It will it also takes into consideration uh, a certain degree of uh, climatic con uh, climatic change consideration. So, I, if, if I recall correctly, Mr. Romberg, <coughs> the when the 2007 maps were adopted, they did not update the flood insurance study at that time. No, that was a, a, a more minor update, if you will. Uh, and City Engineer Joe Stoll participated in a series of meetings. I, I did well as well. In fact, this goes all the way back to the time that Eric Johnston was City Engineer when FEMA started their mapping project for this in Island County in that study. So they did a fairly extensive study here uh, in Island County to determine what the results of the study should be and then what the boundaries of the new map should be. And then the flood insurance program is a federally funded program, is that correct? Right. Okay. And so the premiums for people applying for that insurance goes into supporting that FEMA fund or that flood insurance fund? Right? You know, I'm not really particularly knowledgeable on the, the mechanics yeah. of that, but I can tell you that the majority of the communication that on this topic for us comes from FEMA. Uh, and so we're, we're getting the uh, communication from the federal government. Yeah. And uh, just if I might add on that, uh, currently the total insurance policies in the city combined is roughly $11 million worth of coverage. Uh, that's resulting in an annual premium of uh, $26,000 in total. Uh, since the program's inception, however, uh, there's only been one claim in the city of Oak Harbor, and that was for $4,800. Who pays that premium? That's FEMA. No, no. The, no, the home, no. Oh, who the, pays the, the property premium? Owner. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. The property owners. The property, property owners. Owner. Okay. Yes, right. yes. Yeah. So the city pays premium for their portion of that area, and the other people in that area then, if they want flood insurance, is flood insurance mandatory? It is if you want to get a loan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions? I'm just curious about the increase in the area coverage for flood insurance may be caused by climate changes and global warming, the water rising that increased the area of flood insurance. Uh, again, yes, that's part of the study that they did that 
was the actual study of the Oak Harbor Bay, where they got specific data back from that, and then the multipliers that they use for global global warming effect. Thank you. That's all. Any further questions, comments? If not, thank you. Proceed Thanks to the fine. next one. Three D. This the law. Low Impact Development (LID) recent Supreme Court decision. And this would be this is me Mr. this time. Yes. Couldn't find anybody to hand this one off to. <laughs> um, so before I get started on this, just a couple quick things. Uh, actually, this slide presentation has a few more words on it than you normally see uh, in one of my slide presentations, and that's purposeful. Uh, and there are some terms which are very similar in here, but have distinct meanings. Uh, and so I'll try to make sure that I'm drawing those distinctions for you. As you can see, what we want to cover with you this afternoon is, is in terms of implementing low impact development, uh, there is a recent Supreme Court decision at the Washington level that uh, changes some of the information that we've been sharing with you over the last several months. So uh, because we've been speaking to you so often about uh, stormwater and stormwater regulation and low impact development, I've skipped all of the, the uh, ramp up to that and just reminded you are reminding you rather that our NPDES phase two permit uh, required us to adopt mandatory LID practices in the 2012 manual by uh, December 31st, 2016. And as you recall, uh, we accomplished that and we set that as the effective date for those new regulations. One of uh, probably the key premise during the adoption of this in related to the topic we're talking about today um, is this idea of what rules apply when. Uh, and so as you will recall, we talked to you uh, that applications uh, submitted before December 31st of last year, we're going to use the 2005 manual when it comes time for reviewing them from stormwater compliance. And applications, probably the easiest way to think about that today is think about preliminary plats because that's the one that I think you had the most questions about and it's probably the easiest project for us to think about. So preliminary plat applications, but again, it's broader than that, submitted after that time frame, uh, we understood that we'd be using the 2012 manual. Uh, and this understanding, this premise was based on the idea of the vesting doctrine and a recent uh, court decision. I have a feeling this might be the older version of this presentation, but I will make it do. Uh, so, what court case am I talking about? It's one that's known as the Snohomish County et al. versus the Pollution Control Hearings Board. That's a state hearings body. Uh, uh, and that really had to do with whether or not uh, stormwater rules were things which could be treated like land use controls, right? And so what does that mean to us? How, why is that important? I'll talk about that. So the Court of Appeals decision said yes. We can treat stormwater regulations like land use controls. And that's what we've been telling you all along, which means that the concept of vesting comes into play, which made them subject to the vesting doctrine. So what that really meant was that the rules in place at the time a complete application is submitted are the rules that we're gonna to use to review and approve a project. So let's go back to this slide. That's what gets us to this idea that applications submitted before the December 31st deadline were going to be used, they would have vested to those rules which were in place at that time, which was the 2005 rules. Pretty much a commonly understood concept. Council talked a lot about vesting, as do our development customers. Um, that decision, the Court of Appeals decision, was appealed by to the state Supreme Court by the Department of Ecology and by the Puget Soundkeeper Alliance. As you probably have guessed by now, the Supreme Court um, overturned the Court of Appeals. Uh, timing of that, I don't think really actually makes a whole lot of difference to us, but it is somewhat coincidental that it was two days before the deadline that everything else had to sort of everything else was keyed to. And so the the net effect of their decision is that stormwater regulations adopted under the federal or state permit system, so read NPDES phase two permit are not land use control ordinances subject to state statutory vested rights doctrine. What the heck's all of that mean? 
it means that stormwater regulations are not like our plat regulations, they're not like our zoning code regulations, they are not like landscaping regulations. They are, um, you can't vest to them. And so where does that take us? What does it mean to us? Uh, it means that projects as a whole do not vest to the stormwater regulations in place at the time of a complete land use permit application. For example, a preliminary plat. So, complete land use permit applications submitted before the deadline do not vest to the 2005 manual. It's because the stormwater regulations aren't part of that bundle of rules that, that we actually get to vest to now. They're going to stand by themselves. And so we have to use the rules that are in place at the time the development permit comes in. And this is where, again, we've got some terms which are very, very similar. But the difference there is we're talking about civil plans or building permits. And we, I'm going to walk you through some examples to try to bring this to life here in just a moment. So what does it really mean? What's it going to require us to do? we're going to be required to tell our development customers that they need to, to follow the provisions of the 2012 manual, even for those projects which have vested to all of the other rules that we have, including previously approved preliminary plats and final plats for any development application submitted after December 31st. Now, I know this is a little hard to read, and this is where I got into the part about extra text than what I normally do. I have this on a sheet, so I'll, I'll hand this out in just a moment. But if you'll allow me to walk you through three examples, I, I hope that this will make this topic a little more clear for you. So example number one, example number one is we have a preliminary plat approved prior to the permit deadline. So we got a plat approved prior to December 31st. But they have not yet gotten to the stage where they submitted um, what's called here development application, but what you typically hear us call civil plans or construction plans, or sometimes you might think about them as engineering plans. So we have the plat, we know what the subdivision is gonna look like, but we don't have the actual engineering drawings yet. They haven't been submitted by that date. So the plat now has to be subject to the 2012 rules as do the individual home sites themselves. So plat approved under before December 31st, 2016, but we're going to tell them that, they, that their engineering has to live with the new manual and that their home designs and, the, and their individual plot plans will have to live with the 2012 manual. The second example is that, okay, we net, we've got a plat that was approved and now we have those, those engineering plans approved prior to that December 31st date. In this case, the plat is, is okay. It gets to live under the 2005 rules, but the homes themselves are still gonna have to follow the 2012 manual because of when the building permit came in, it's gonna come in after the end of the year. Final example for you is a final plat. So now we've got final plat, it's recorded, those lots legally exist. Uh, it was done before the December 31st date. Construction of individual homes are already underway, um, but we're within a five-year time limit that applies to vesting. Good news is the plat's all right. It does not have to change the standards that it lives with. The not-so-good news is that any of those building permits that come in after the first of the year will have to follow the 2012 manual even though the house right next door may have had to follow the 2005 manual because it was submitted before the end of the year or it was built last year. And again, I have that on a, this is on a handout so we can uh, share that with you. I'll take questions in a minute, but I just, maybe I'll get to the last, uh, to this slide. Um, so we, we absolutely have projects within Oak Harbor that are affected by this ruling. Um, probably some of you can think of those off the top of your head, but we can discuss those uh, if, if you'd like. Um, we're going to do our best to communicate with the project proponents, informing them of this change. Um, we uh, will do our best to um, assist them navigate through this, this change in their circumstance. 
Um, I, I did get some great comments on the presentation uh, and I, I incorporated those. I must have somehow saved the wrong one, but, but I got some help from some of my fellow staff members and they helped me remember that there is a new bill which has been introduced in the legislature, which is intended to try to fix this. Um, I don't know that it's possible to fix this through the, the state's legislative authority. That's a whole separate conversation, but at least somebody has tried something. And so perhaps what the council can do with us is to help communicate your thoughts and your concerns uh, either on that bill and or uh, when you go to city action days in about a month or so. Uh, and so uh, this is obviously a pretty big topic. We've been scrambling trying to figure out how do we package this information and share it with you? How do we package it and share it um, with our development customers? Um, and then, frankly, how do we uh, get ourselves up to speed so that we're sure we're following the right rules in any one of the handful of different kinds of situations that we can envision. So, um, to summarize, we updated our code. We were very clear that we were going through that process about vesting and what our understanding was at vesting at that time, and that was based on the then standing Court of Appeals decision. Um, Supreme Court has, has overturned that and, and said that those, the, the premise we are operating under is not the case. Um, so we have to change our communication with our customers. That's, I think that's a big point for you to understand. Uh, the second big point for you to understand is that our customers are going to have to do a fair amount of re-engineering uh, in, a, in a pretty wide variety of circumstances in order to, to match these new rules. So with that, I'll, I'll do my best to help you with your questions. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Great comments from the council. Mrs. Smith. I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning just in case. Sometimes when a regulation or just trying to help future developers, builders, whatever, we've offered a class or information or something, Will you do that with this also, kind of, so you're not repeating it each and every time? Or, I mean, you well, know, I could see someone come in here and all of a sudden just start wanting to wring <coughs> one of the staff members' neck about they weren't expecting that. So I would think offense would be better than waiting to yeah, defend. And, and we are talking about what's the, the most efficient way to do that. Okay. Uh, Maybe it is a, a, a forum, if you will, where we invite um, the land developer themselves, the home builder, uh, the private sector engineers, and just talk our way through what we think some of this means. Um, and I'm not going to come anywhere near touching the engineering side of that. We have way more qualified people in the room mm -hmm. to do that than myself. But I think one of the greatest challenges is will be somebody will come in and ask us, or say to us, tell me what I need to do in order to, to implement this. And as you've heard from us, it, there's, it's not a one size fits all answer. It's, it's driven by the property, it's driven by the circumstances, it's driven by the soil conditions, it's driven by what stage was your project in before. And so um, <coughs> we're not gonna have easy pat answers for them. One of the things that, that I will do, uh, and I just haven't quite gotten to accomplish yet, is we're going to reach out to SICPA to see, you know, are they informing their members of this already? We, we already know that the Master Builders Association at the state level has been informed of this and, and are, are well aware of this. We just don't know how is that information getting down to the local level yet. Um, so yes, we're trying to figure out what's the most efficient way to communicate so that we can be the most help that we can. That almost might also be an avenue besides us as elected officials knowing of a potential bill that might fix this, that if they know about it and the bill number, they could also add their two cents worth. And so you have more people making comments yeah. about it. Um, I, I so. think that this will be the thing that will drive a lot of the comments. If, if this hasn't gotten people's attention before, this change at, at the state level will get people's attention. Well, I know as a, as a council member, I wasn't too happy about it. And what do you mean we can't fight it? I mean, we were pretty wound up as a council about this isn't fair, this isn't right. And um, I think um, Mr. Luth was 
pretty well battered and beaten in some of the meetings, being the only one to say, wait a minute, hold on, why not, why not, and being shut down. So um, I think this will be a very big deal, but I would hope that we would try, I mean, we've got the information, but kind of like the FEMA thing, get help get the information out, and hopefully you won't be attacked too terribly much when they come in to do a permit. And, the, I, I, what I didn't mention is is that um, staff is drafting a letter that we that we're going to send to those properties that we know right away okay. mm -hmm. are, really need to get this information, uh, and we've got a first crack at the draft done already. Uh, I expect to have that done here fairly soon, and we'll get that out to um, the applications which are currently pending with us or the ones that have been the most active, uh, and so that'll be our initial. Uh, approach is to get the word out quickly and then figure out how do we try to maybe communicate with a larger group could would it be possible to let the council know who because sometimes we get strange phone calls and go your staff is changing the rules again and if we kind of know who might not sure. that they will but it kind of helps when we say wait 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 let me investigate here and i know they have a list or i mean We'll figure out a way to make sure so the council's not, exactly not caught flat yeah. either. Not all the time, but I'm sure Councilman Omer gets a lot of calls <laughs> from some people about your darn council is changing the stupid rules again. Why? So it, it just good everybody point. can kind of be on the same page. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. questions from Mr. Omer. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So, Mr. Powers. Um, let's say a plat, and there, there are some that exist here, where the city has already agreed you have a recorded plat. The improvements are put in. The developer has basically completed a contract, entered into a contract with the city to put in certain improvements. They're already in place. That's the agreement. It's a contract. But the house has not been built but all the other improvements have been put in to serve that lot, and they've been paying utility fees for water meters and stuff like that. Are you telling me then that they, their, the people who purchase their properties and build a house then have to comply with the 2012, which means they have to go get an engineer, do a soils analysis, do a design for handling stormwater hard for hard surfaces on that property. That is an, an addition to the contract agreement that they already, that the developer or the applicant has already completed with that, with the city. So first of all, Mr. Allenberg, I don't think I would apply the word contract. Uh, to a subdivision approval. It's not really a contract. There's no agreement between the city and the, and the developer that, that both parties have a role in this. And, and so I wouldn't use the word contract in the, in the sense that I think that you're using it. Um, it's, it's an approval process, right? And, and so as you well know, there are standards that have to be met. You meet the standards, the council approves the preliminary plan. In my mind, that's that's not a contract. There's no binding agreement afterwards in that. Now, what normally happens is that vesting tells us these are the rules that are going to apply for a specific period of time once that approval has been put into place. And so in that sense, there is some level of understanding as to what the rules are going to be. Now, to answer your question, yes, that is absolutely what's going to have to happen, is that in a developed plat, um, and let's pay Island Place, which is an example in our community. It's partially built out. Uh, the final plat in those last phases was approved within the last year or so. Um, those lots, which do not yet have building permits issued for them, will be required to meet the 2012 manual standards. Well, therein lies my argument. When you talk about affordable housing, you might as well stop the conversation because there isn't going to be affordable housing for middle-income people. Based you'll get, on you'll get no argument from staff. I know, I know, and I know you're the messenger on this thing. For our message to our legislative bodies, I think the one thing that we really have to target for this area and for other areas of similar weather patterns, we should not be treated by the Western Washington model that applies to Olympia and to Cedar Rowley or any other NPDES community. 
We don't have the rainfall. We don't have the need to handle stormwater to the same capacity that Olympia has or any of the other places with, with much higher rainfall. But the, we can change our FEMA map. Why can't we have a rainfall map also that's recognized by DOE? That's the argument, that's the position that I would like to take to our representatives. And, and with that, I won't say any more. Smoke is already coming out of my ears. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think it's just restating what's already been said. Can you go back to your old matrix, please? Yes is the no. So before there was a whole bunch more no's up there, correct? There might have been? Uh, yes. You, you would have had more no's, uh, and now it's more towards the yes side. And so without pulling up the email, I know we get our weekly email from our permit coordinator. It tells us the permits pipeline. Yep. There was a preliminary plat that was approved, I think, on the 28th. Right before the end of the year? Uh, submitted. Submitted. Submitted and, and was deemed to have a complete application status. And that's that in, in when we talk about vesting and we talk about the rules which apply to any one given time, uh, complete application is the thing that, that makes that decision for us. But that doesn't apply now as a Not anymore. It applied very much on December 28th. It no longer applies. So, and I know before, Mr. Glues, others have said you guys have worked hard to get this phase two permit changed. We've sat in hearings, I think, or even participated with some other communities as far as litigation. Is that correct? No, we've, we've looked at what was going on in other communities. Uh, we certainly, we meaning Brad and mostly folks from Public Works, have participated in uh, umpteen hours of training uh, and, you know, and argued the, the more practical points of why things should be different here. Uh, but uh, we have not, to my knowledge, ever participated in litigation that sought to get us out of the phase two status. Um, I think if I could, Mr. Almberg has probably the best line of attack for us to pursue, which is if we're stuck living by the rules, let's make sure that we've got the right things which apply to us, particularly in the amount of how much stormwater we have to deal with. And, and I agree, I would very much concur, and so Dr. Merriman, you know, I would make a direct request to you to talk to the mayor that we put together a concerted effort as a council and administration to actually present this a very formal case to our legislators who are in Olympia. We actually had this conversation at the county this morning a little bit. Mr. Olmberg came down and had a discussion with us about at the COG meeting about affordable housing. Um, we talked a little bit about the legislative side of it, what things we can do. So we're already putting that material together and as well the county commissioners would like to join in with us as well even though they're not an mpds2 uh, they're interested in giving some input into that they kind of have the feeling that who knows 10 years from now these types of rules may apply to them as well so we will be putting that together already and making sure that the mayor is, is involved in that when we go down to olympia can we just repeat again that there are these three or four criteria to get us to that phase two Population Great. density, presence of the air station, and potential listing of endangered species, I think, were the, were the three categories. Yeah, full challenge shellfish. Right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Any further questions, comments? I do have a copy yeah. of the matrix and a real easy summary um, for you uh, if you'd like. I also have uh, a slightly more detailed summary that came off of MRSC's page that. Uh, lays a little more of the detail for you. And for those of you who might be interested, I also have a copy of the Supreme Court's decision if you'd like to really wade your way through that. Quick yeah, go ahead. Uh, you go mentioned ahead. MRIC. Um, I happen to be on their board of directors, and I know they love to have the story. So whatever you decide to put together to send to the legislature with our story and our facts, Please be sure I have a copy and I will be sure that MRSC has it because that's the way they also help defend things. Um, they haven't, they admit, done as well at being sure they have actual stories. Like we have been told from AWC to tell our legislators, don't just say, this is what we want, we need it, but what are some uh, 
prime examples of it. And the same thing exists for MRSC. Plus, they are also fighting for their funding. Okay. So um, I think it will stay, but they're still going to have to fight for it. So I would love to also, when we have it, have something signed, and then I will make sure MRSC has that also at a board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Tim, I'd like to make one comment, too, about that uh, LID manual. One of the things that I noticed reading into that as I reviewed this with uh, Mr. Kluth, is when you look at the participants and they talk about the participants, the groups who put it together, they went to public meetings, et cetera. One of the things that glared at me in terms of participants in putting that together, there were approximately 20, between 20 and 25 participants listed on that. I recognized two people who were in either the construction or development. I did not recognize anybody else from any other segments of the economy participating in that. Most of them, overwhelmingly most of them, were members of DOE, Puget Sound Partnership, and consultants who work for DOE. They're all like-minded, like-thinking, and I'm not putting down the purposes of protecting the environment. I'm just saying if everybody is thinking the same way and doing the same way, somebody's not thinking. And I don't think there's enough cross-section of input into that. And I hope that the legislature will take a look at this and balance that out because I still go back to my smoking ears. We are not going to get affordable housing with these types of roadblocks, whether they're in the city or in the surrounding areas in our community. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? If not, thank you everyone for participating. That concludes our workshop meeting.